Hey kids, it's Mr. Fly here, hope you're well, and welcome to another edition of Bike News, your monthly opportunity to get caught up with all that's been going on in the world of motorcycling here in the UK for the month of February 2022. So if you're interested in that, stick around and stay tuned, let's get cracking. Alrighty, grab yourself a brew because this will probably be quite a long one. We've got uh, five editions of uh, MCN to go through and loads of stories that I've highlighted as well. Lots been going on this month. Uh, and don't forget, stay tuned to the very end and we'll get some uh, parish notices as well where I can uh, tell you what's coming up on the channel in the next month if you're interested. Right, without further ado, let's crack on then. First paper. So first story that I've uh, pulled out here says here, Biking roads threat. So um, this is just um, an example of how we get such bad press here in the UK, us motorcycles. So I don't know why, but this is all to do with speed limits. So uh, nearly 700,000 is to be spent installing speed cameras on roads near Lumi's Cafe, which is a popular biking cafe down south somewhere. Uh, I've never been there myself, but I know lots of people do like going there. Uh, whilst elsewhere, the Horseshoe Pass is having its speed limit lowered by 30%, despite little evidence of speeding. Horseshoe Pass uh, up in Wales. I did that when I did that thing with the um, Welsh Police last year. Great ride around there. Um, Mion Valley MP Flick Drummond added that she welcomed this new weapon in the armoury of the police and noted that antisocial motorbike noise causes so much anguish. Does it? I don't know, maybe it does there, I don't know, certainly I don't notice it around where I live. Uh, the speed reduction on the Horseshoe Pass, the A542, is the result of a four-year campaign by local councillors. Uh, the new speed limit will be 40 miles per hour, per hour down from the current 60. That's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Uh, speaking on the subject, County Councillor Graham Timms said he was delighted the limit has been approved. So, be interested to see what your thoughts are on this. Of course, no one wants um, antisocial biking. No one wants um, people being disturbed or hooliganism on the roads that gives us all a bad name. But this is just, you know, there's something about um, biking here in the UK where we get a bad press all the time. I don't know why. Uh, maybe we need to behave ourselves more, I don't know. But interest in your views in the comments below. Um, is it us? Are we are we bad? Or uh, or do we need to do something? Just just build the image of biking into something that's actually positive. Uh, let's face it, most people that uh, ride bikes for leisure these days are you know similar people to you and I. My sort of age, you know, tend to be older people, let's face it. More sensible people, perhaps. Um, and I think all this stuff, uh, you know, belongs in the past. Anyway, bit of a whinge there to start off with. Let's uh, get on to something a bit more bit more fun. Right, digging the dirt. Here we go. So this is one of these comparisons that MCN does. This time they're comparing the Triumph Street Scrambler with the um, Ducati Scrambler Night Shift, a new addition to that bike. Uh, this Ducati is 10,195. The Street Scrambler, 9,700. Now the big Triumph um, Scrambler used to get all the headlines, didn't it? The 1200, because that's sort of the glamour bike, I guess. But personally, having ridden both the 1200 and the 900cc Street Scrambler, I prefer the Street Scrambler. If you are actually going to go off road, it kind of makes more sense because it's kind of smaller and lighter and easy to handle for somebody if you're a, you know, a smaller stature like me. And also quite a lot of looks of it and the sound of it as well. Um, the um, Ducati Scrambler, I'm not such a fan of. I like the big version, the 1200, but, or is it the 1100? Can't remember. But the, the smaller version, I'm not so sure on. Let's see what the verdict is uh, that MCN have given them here. They've given them both four stars, so we can't tell there. But Phil West, the reviewer, has said, uh, if you want an Italian take on Scramblers that delivers a sportier ride, you won't be disappointed. But its price, dash, and some details do jar, if only slightly. If you fancy a proper British take on the theme, Triumph's new street scrambler pulls no punches and delivers on all counts, avoids virtually any criticism, well, um, and now has the premium machine to match it. Costs less too. Well, that sounds pretty good there, so very much a fan of the Triumph there. This, the, the Triumph has been updated since I rode it a couple of years back. Maybe it's time I had another go on one of these. This could be um, one of these um, potential bikes that uh, Mrs. Fly, if she ever passes a test, um, uh, could go for because it's got a 790mm seat height, so nice and low, nice and accessible, and does look the business. I do like the looks of that. Anyway, there we go. That's that one. Moving on, what's next? It's something very special. Ducati says the all-new V4 Pikes Peak is their sportiest Multistrada yet, and they're not wrong. Now, this is kind of uppermost in my mind because I've been riding the Multistrada V4 uh, quite a lot of late, and the um, Pikes Peak version is kind of their premier version, if you like. It does look beautiful in this paint scheme, I must admit. I'm not sure about the little screen on it, um, but other than that, I think it's a lovely, lovely bike. I love the Multistrada anyway, but this in this paint scheme looks absolutely beautiful. Um, it's got a smaller front wheel, 17 inch instead of 19 inch, so it's much more on-road um, oriented or track oriented, if you like, rather than the um, standard Multistrada that has a sort of a semblance of being able to go off-road, although really, how many people do? I don't know. I certainly wouldn't if I had one. Anyway, what does it say about the Pikes Peak? Uh, the return of a single-sided swing arm and the 17-inch front wheel, 
good. Uh, Single-sided swing arms always look good, don't they? That was removed on the V4. Uh, oddly, single-sided swing arms are often heavier, which is quite interesting. Um, the sportier riding mode it's got has now got a new race mode, apparently. Uh, more aggressive um, and responsive engine and chassis apparently. Uh, the setup is on the stiff side and the ride will never feel as plush as the stock Multistrada. So possibly a bike like this would be wasted on me, even though I like the paint scheme. Superbike levels of cornering ability and mechanical grip on the road, thanks primarily to the 17-inch front wheel and fresh geometry. Liking the sound of this. Whereas the standard Multistrada's have to cater for a slice of off-road action, the Pikes Peak isn't designed with mud in mind and the ergonomics feel far more natural. So yeah, I might have to have a crack on one of these at some point. It's £24,595, an expensive bike, but what a beauty. In my mind, I'm wondering whether I should... Um, uh, replace my uh, GS in fullness of time with something else and certainly the Multistradas are up there now with the likes of the GS and uh, that's one of the bikes that I'm thinking about. I want to see the new Tiger 1200 from uh, Triumph as well so I'm not going to be making any decisions anytime soon or doing anything rash but uh, certainly this bike is up there worth a look isn't it? What a beautiful beautiful machine. Right, next up, last story in this paper, my top five CRF tweaks. Now, you may know, uh, if you've watched the channel for any length of time, I'm a massive fan of the Honda CRF 250L. I used to have one, sold it last year, about this time last year. Uh, do miss that bike, but I kind of run out of green lanes around here. Um, and I had that bike for a long time and did lots of tweaks. So here, um, Simon Ralph has decided what his top five mods would be. His first one is a suspension upgrade. Uh, he says it's the single most important mod I've done so far. Um, he's put in a, a, a KTEX suspension, basically, which costs, £456.49 um, and an SSK piston kit 180 19 um, and then some labour as well so that's what four or five about 700 quid's worth of upgrade on the suspension so bear that in mind and then down here he's got some other stuff as well but he said exhaust system I'll mention this because I upgraded the exhaust of mine he said I do like a bike that sounds nice so the standard system had to go the CRF 250L is a very quiet machine uh, the Yoshimura offer a full stainless exhaust uh, made in the USA £714 so we're looking at sort of uh, what's that Twelve, thirteen hundred pounds of mod, just those two. So suddenly, your good value six grand bike comes quite a bit more expensive, doesn't it? But everyone's the road if that's what you want to do. I did something similar to mine, so I can't, you know, I'll be hypocritical to complain. On the exhaust front, though, I put a, a loud exhaust on mine. I put an FMF exhaust on mine. It did sound epic, but I always felt kind of guilty because although I liked it, one of the things, again, talking about giving bikers a bad name, one of the things that really does annoy people when they're out for a walk around the green lanes is, is noisy motorcycles. So actually, I think if I was going down this route again, I'd probably stick with the quiet exhaust. This is where electric bikes come in, I think, off-roading. You're not harming anyone if you're making no noise, are you? So uh, as much as we all love a noisy exhaust, I think in terms of the uh, off-road game, I think we'd be doing our, all ourselves favors if we kept them a bit quiet. Again, interested in your views below on that one. All right, so that was the first paper. Loads more to come, so I'm rattling through here quite quickly. Next one. First story, all new Tiger Cub. Now this is amazing. This is something I've been uh, advocating for ages. This is potentially Triumph making a smaller capacity motorcycle. So here we have Spy testing, single cylinder Triumph set to challenge Royal Enfield Meteor. Wouldn't this be great? So they've got a spy shot here of a bike that looks very much like a Triumph. If you look at the engine casing, it's got that uh, familiar triangular shape that is kind of um, signature Triumph engine, if you like. It's definitely a single cylinder machine. And it's got also uh, a very familiar looking radiator on here, the tall, thin, vertical type that, again, is straight off of other Triumphs. So it's definitely a Triumph here. It says here, spy shots have emerged of the first new single cylinder Triumph for 50 years as the British brand looked to fight it back against the likes of Royal Enfield. Uh, looking at these machines, it's clear that they are Triumphs with that classic tank shape, engine design and infill panels behind the rider's knees. You could almost mistake them for street twins. I agree, it does look very much a Triumph. We'd expect the new bike to be around 350 to 500 cc. Just the sweet spot for riding on the road, as far as I'm concerned. We'll call it the Tiger Cub, and if Triumph don't, they're missing a trick. I 100% agree there. Let's hope it is called a Tiger Cub. Great name from the past. Um, both bikes that they've seen have upside down forks, LED lights, radial front calipers, and TFT dashes. So they're pretty, you know, pretty high tech for a single cylinder. Let's hope the pricing's right. We'd expect Triumph to reveal the finished bikes towards the end of 2022, with stock arriving in dealerships by spring 2023. So this is one I'm going to be watching like a hawk. Uh, just be amazing if they can. Price these very competitively, you know, six and a half grand, something like that, and you can get your first rung on the Triumph ladder. That would just be amazing. This is a, one of those joint ventures I think they're doing with the um, Indian manufacturing company Bajaj or Baha, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, um, which they, they talked about a few years back and then nothing came of it. So it looks like this might be the first fruits of that particular partnership. So looking forward to seeing what comes of that. 
All right, next up, Going Rogue. Uh, this is the new Stealthy Scout, uh, Scout Rogue from Indian. Um, it says here it has a fairing, a new fairing and sportier stance. Okay, fair enough. So the fairing, I'm not sure about. Got sort of a bikini fairing. Not sure if I like that or not. Can't quite make my mind up on that. I'm sure it actually probably helps with a bit with uh, protection from the wind. Uh, the other thing I'm not sure about is um, the exhaust. Look how long those things look. Is that good or not? Again, I just can't make my mind up on this, whether I think it's horrible or whether I think it's lovely. I'm kind of in between. I've ridden a few Indians and they are nice bikes to ride, so uh, I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt, I think. Anyway, it says here, meet the Indian Scout Rogue, the fourth model in the American firm's popular 1133cc cruiser lineup. Uh, seat height is just 649 millimeters, so really low, uh, helping you support the 241 kilograms dry weight, so heavy old bike. Provided the Rogue's forward thrust is the firm's liquid cooled V twin lump, as found in the rest of the Scout range, produces 93.8 brake horsepower, 72.3 pounds feet of torque. Uh, Black Smoke Edition will cost 13,295 while the Stealth Grey and Sagebrush, I love these names, where do they get these from? Um, they cost 13,495 so 13 and a half grand gets you this, uh, This actually I think it is quite a cool looking cruiser actually. And there's something about Indian I like, I don't know, I think it's just because it's a bit different, you don't see many around you on the road. Uh, again, if I had unlimited funds and unlimited garage space, I'd probably have an Indian in the garage. I, let's face it, I'd have every bike, I, I love all bikes. Quickly, moving on. Right, factory custom Ducatis. Now, talking of expensive motorcycles, this is one that uh, if you've got money burning a, a hole in your pocket and you fancy something a bit exotic. Ducati have announced a new custom program allowing riders to commission one-off bespoke machines which are produced in partnership with the firm's central design department. So effectively, you spec up a bike, they make it at the Ducati factory for you. Uh, Would-be owners can choose from a range of finishes, precious materials, perf uh, performance accessories, and more, with every stage of the creation process documented, including initial design sketches. You can imagine how much this is gonna cost. Um, Ducati only able to accept a very limited number of projects each year, is what it says here. It doesn't actually give you an idea of how much it's gonna cost, um, but, uh, well, we're going to be talking a lot of money here if you're you know actually engaging with their designers directly aren't they so uh, be interesting to see if it who does this and how much they cost but uh, I, I love the idea but uh, yeah maybe not for not for the normal man in the street fun though right ktm have got a new 890 lineup it's been spied uh, with one very off-road focus version apparently uh, here we go here's the pictures of this it says here our spies in austria have spotted ktm testing a trio of new 890 adventure prototypes showing how the range is set to expand when the next generation model is revealed the most obvious change shared by all the derivatives is a new fairing uh, the side panels now reach up to the carried over headlight which is entirely surrounded by transparent screen molding uh, the revamped 8 Night Adventure range will debut later this year uh, as the 2023 lineup. Okay, so we, we might see this later this year. So a couple of things here, or the, or the main thing that strikes me is, once again, I mean, I, I love KTM as a manufacturer. They're great people to do business with and uh, lovely people, and the bikes are great to ride, but the looks just don't work, do they? Um, I actually quite like the, the, the front light, but the rest of the bike, to me, doesn't hang together. And again, I know that this is only personal opinion. You may well disagree. And again, please feel free to point out the errors of my ways in the comments below. Uh, but this screen now this, and the surround that's all transparent, it just looks horrible. Um, it just kind of looks unfinished. I don't know. I mean, it, it, the main picture here hasn't got a screen at all, but the picture at the top right here has shows you this um, sort of sur uh, transparent surround that it's got. It just, I think it's a step back. I'll be interested to see what you think on that. Do we think KTM need to fire their designers and get some Italians in? I absolutely do. Sorry, KTM, but um, yeah, that's, that's not a step in the right direction in terms of design, I think. Personal opinion, of course. Right, cleared for takeoff. Can Suzuki's new GT beat Kawasaki's SX as a perfect sporty getaway bike? This is interesting to me because I've been riding the um, GT of late. There'll be videos coming up in due course on the channel on that. I haven't ridden the latest version of the SX. I, I rode a version about three or four years ago. Lovely bike. Um, and uh, well, let's see what um, let's see what verdict MCN came up with they've given the Kawasaki five stars and the Suzuki four which is interesting because when the uh, Suzuki GT came out everybody was full of about how great it was weren't they this is what um, it doesn't amaze me because this happens quite a lot often when these new bikes come out you, you read articles and you see reviews on YouTube and stuff from the launch and everybody says how great these bikes are then a few months down the line when everybody's got used to that idea um, and it starts to be compared with other existing machines suddenly they're not so great after all it would really annoy me if I bought a bike based on those initial reviews and then it turned out they're saying oh actually it's not so good after all it's just a little thing that irks me slightly that people not just journalists but reviewers generally seem to change their mind down the line on these you know either it was good to start with or it wasn't anyway 
a little bit of a whinge there. Oh God, I'm in a bit of a mood today. Right, anyway, it says here, and this is from Michael Neves, my favourite uh, tester. He says, both the Kawasaki and new Suzuki do what traditional sports tourists do best, neatly mix all day comfort with head banging performance. I like the sound of that. Of all uh, the GSX S1000 models produced since 2015, the new GT is easily the best. But it doesn't make, take many miles on the Kawasaki to realise what a class act that is. It's more refined in every area. The engine is smoother, gearing more relaxed on the motorway, suspension plusher, tyres grippier, brakes more powerful and paint finishes deeper. Kawasaki have had a decade to polish the SX to perfection and it really shows. So there's no doubt there, Nevesi thinks that the uh, Kawasaki is the better bike. I have to say, in terms of looks alone, I think the, the Kawasaki gets it. Um, it's just something about the front end on the GT that again, everybody said in those initial launch reviews and how lovely it was to look at this GT. But I, I personally find the front end too long somehow there's something about it but uh, it is a great bike to ride and as i say more in-depth stuff coming up on the gt on my channel soon so if you're interested in that bike stick around and stay tuned all right next paper okay first story in here it's an electric story now i know electric bikes always uh, split opinions don't they but this is the electric street triple or well, this is what uh, mcn are calling it from triumph do you remember triumph um, worked with williams and uh, one of the universities was it warwick university a while back to come up with power plants and some of the technical uh, underpinnings of this bike that they're going to launch it's moved to the next stage now and they've come up with this this design which does look i have to say really nice it's got it does look like a you know a moderned up souped up street or speed triple i think it looks great and if the numbers come to fruition this could be the one to watch let's have a quick read of what it says here 174 brake horsepower 220 kilograms so powerful and normal sort of weight not super heavy which these electric bikes normally are with the big battery packs 120 mile range which if realistic sounds doable doesn't it because you know there are many um, piston engine bikes that only do 100 miles before you have to do a fill up. 0 to 80% charge in 20 minutes, which again is excellent. Um, testing to begin soon. So uh, from numbers only, it sounds like it could be a practical proposition. Of course, it depends how much it's going to cost. Um, Triumph have unveiled phase three of their TE1 electric project with a complete bike that clearly resembles their trademark street triple. From Triumph's perspective, this has meant finishing the frame and selecting the ancillary components such as brakes, suspension and other running gear. All right, okay, this means the fact that it's moving to the next stage. Uh, uh, to really nail the handling, the Phase 3 Williams has been, ref oh, sorry, in Phase 3, that's this testing phase, Williams have been refining the internal architecture of the battery pack to ensure the bike has the optimum centre of gravity as well as finishing the charging components. Uh, interestingly, there's the option for a lot more power if they want it. So apparently this um, 174 brake horsepower is what they've decided is what feels about right on the road, but they can come out with other versions that are much more powerful if deemed necessary. The T1 unit is actually capable of over 670 brake horsepower. Blimey. It says here perhaps a bit much, I would agree. That's, that's more than my car, that's nuts. Uh, so what next? Phase 4 begins now and will last approximately 6 months during which time Triumph will do live testing of the prototype. So hopefully in the next six months, we're going to see how this one goes, and maybe we'll start to understand when we're likely to see this in the shops, how much it's going to cost us. But uh, yeah, of all the electric bikes I've come across so far, this sounds like, from a numbers perspective, and the way it looks, this could be the one to be, couldn't it? Or could be the one to have. I, I really like the sound of this. So uh, yeah, we'll be keeping a close eye on that one. Well done, Triumph. Right, next up, CCM. British brand CCM turned to titanium to celebrate their golden anniversary. Another CCM has come out. They're always bringing out these new versions of the Spitfire because they do these in limited runs. So they have to subtly change it every now and then to keep within the regs. Anyway, this one's a bit of a special. Uh, CCM have built a special edition Spitfire using a titanium frame as a tribute to the pioneering work of founder Alan Clues to mark their 50th anniversary. It does look nice, I have to say. Uh, with a wet weight minus fuel of 136 kilograms. Now, Call me old-fashioned, but I don't understand what wet weight minus fuel means. Is it wet or is it dry? Anyway, it says it's 136 kilograms, which is pretty light, whatever way you look at it. Uh, with 62 brake horsepower on tap from a 600cc single, so it's going to be a hell of a thump of this, um, it gives a higher power-to-weight figure than a Lamborghini Aventador. Wow. <laughs> uh, one cautionary note, the Heritage costs an eye-watering £28,995. So if you've got a spare almost 30 grand knocking about, you can have a single-cylinder 600cc bike. Hmm. I think I might give that one a miss. Looks nice, but that is just that is just ridiculous, isn't it? Moving on. Uh, bargain fun back in vogue for 2022. This is this um, Chinese bike we've talked about before, uh, and I've said that I quite like the look of, about, of it. People always criticise me when I talk about Chinese bikes, but I, I, I maintain ignore them at your peril because I think this Vogue could be a good bike. It looks fantastic. Chinese brand Vogue have released a new A2 compliant adventure that combines big bike features with a small bike price. 
The 650 DSX is powered by 652 single, which produces 47 brake horsepower and 44 pound-feet of torque. So it's not superly powerful, but you know, as a beginner adventure bike, maybe just right. Quality KYB suspension, Pirelli Scorpion rally tyres, um, Nissan braking, properly switchable rear ABS. Um, in standard trim, it costs 6,399, so bargain for all that stuff. Um, and for an extra 500, they'll fit a luggage system, uh, which is near 400, saving over buying the bits as standard. So I think it looks good. I think it could be a practical proposition, this bike. I just say, let's keep an eye on it, because I think the Chinese are coming as far as motorcycles are concerned. Right, a letter here that I uh, wanted to just um, draw your attention to. Norton nor need to be more affordable. This is from Trevor Gleedle, who actually sent an email to the letters page. I fear the new Norton company are missing the point with their V4s. Surely they should be making the most of the brand's heritage of making accessible models. The Atmos range was a breath of fresh air after the underdeveloped 961, but sadly is yet to see the light of day. I could not agree with Trevor Moore here. Those Atlases that we were promised before it all went kaput um, just looked cracking, didn't they? Again, this is definitely a bike that would find room in my garage. I love the idea of smaller capacity British bikes. Uh, and these just looked lovely. And if they rode well, then yeah, I would definitely have loved one of these. I'd love to see these back. So yeah, as much as I wish New Norton you know, huge success. I think it's going to be, it's great that they've now got proper funding and proper factory and everything else seems to be going right with it. Let's start to see some more affordable models churned out though. If they can knock out bikes that are less than 10 grand, I think they will absolutely fly off the shelves. Certainly I'd be first in the queue, I can tell you. Uh, again, interested to hear your views on that one. Next up in this um, paper, they've compared the Multistrada V2S, which I'm yet to ride, against the Triumph Tiger 900 GT Pro, which uh, I have ridden, or at least a version of it. I love the Triumph Tiger 900. It's, uh, in fact, I think last year or 2020, it was kind of my bike of the year. I, I absolutely love those uh, Tigers. I think they're great value. They look good. They ride well. Um, but then I'm a bit of a Triumph fanboy. But then I'm a Ducati fanboy as well. Uh, and I love the Multistradas. And uh, from reviews I've seen, the V2 may be the better road bike. I don't know. Let's see what um, the verdict is in here. I'm this paper they've given the triumph tiger surprisingly to me three out of five stars and the multistrada five out of five so they clearly way prefer the multistrada it's good to see a bit difference in the score rating here so that's good what have they said triumph uh, Tiger 900 Pro is a good motorcycle. Uh, the Ducati, however, is exceptional. In every situation, it either matches the Triumph or outperforms it. From fuel economy and motorway comfort to backlane ag agility, rider excitement, and engine stomp. Okay, so clearly they much prefer the uh, the Ducati. So I'll have to reserve my judgment till I get a go on it. I am getting that. I think next month I've got in the diary to have a go on the V2. Really looking forward to seeing how that compares with the V4, uh, and of course now against the Triumph Tiger as well. I think the Ducati does look nicer. To be fair, um, but uh, and the and the Ducati is fourteen six four six versus thirteen two for the Tiger, so uh, just over a grand cheaper the Tiger. But um, well, we'll see. It sounds like um, looking at you know what MCN have said that the uh, the Ducati is worth that extra money. But uh, I'll let you know when I've had a ride on it. Okay, last but not least from uh, this paper, Ultimate Six Appeal, uh, BMW six-cylinder K1600 GT Uber Tourer gets a host of new upgrades, but have they worked? Uh, this again is another bike I've been talking to BMW about borrowing. I don't think I've got a date in the diary yet, but I'm hoping later this year I will get a go on this. I'm particularly interested, of course, as I'm an owner of the new Goldwing, uh, and this is kind of the primary competitor for that, I guess. Let's see what it says here. It's been 11 years since BMW unleashed the XS All Areas K1600 GT. It's been tweaked for Euro 5. Um, the 1649cc inline six still produces 158 brake horsepower, which is quite a lot more than the Goldwing, which I think is 125, something like that. Uh, but it's the power is delivered 1,000 RPM sooner, so it sounds like it's been tuned a bit lower down for the road, so that sounds nice. Um, equipment level is everything you'd expect from a 20 grand plus BMW, and it's endless, endlessly comfortable for rider and pillion alike. It's as capable in corners, can crush continents, and is still every inch the dream tourer to take on that epic trip. Um, Michael Neves uh, says here, BMW's updated K1600 GT is cool, comfortable, beautifully made, and covers huge swathes of ground as gracefully as it constantly surprises you with its unwavering appetite for corners. <gasps> Take a breath. Uh, its price will be out of reach for many, but for the ultimate in touring decadence with the sporty twist, it's hard to beat. So it says here it's 23.95, which, you know what BMWs are like, normally you spec them up and suddenly you'll add 10 grand to that, but on the surface of it, considerably cheaper than the Goldwing, which you're looking near a 34. I would argue with Newsy here, because uh, when he says, you know, ultimate in touring decadence, it's hard to beat. 
I like to think the Goldwing would probably beat it, but I don't know, I haven't ridden it yet, so I, I, I need to ride it. I will, of course, be biased as a Goldwing owner. Um, but the, the, the K1600 looks lovely. I've ridden the older version of the K1600 about four or five years ago, and it was a lovely bike, but I did find it awfully top heavy, I have to say. The beauty of the Goldwing is it being a boxer configuration, the weight is nice and low, um, and that makes it easily manageable. And for a big old beer moth of a bike, making it easily manageable is very important. So I'll be interested to see what this is like in comparison now, see if the weight is a bit lower. And also I'll be interested to see if they've implemented like a reverse uh, gear on it and so on, how that works. Because uh, again, that's something that I find very useful in the Goldwing. Anyway, stay tuned for more on the big BMW 6 and the K1600 GT on the channel soon. First story in this one, a little extra goes a long, long way. This is the uh, new Tenere World Raid. Um, I wondered what you think about this, because it gets, reviews of this are always very glowing, aren't they? People seem to love the Tenere 700, uh, and I'm sure it's a great bike. But for me, I just cannot get on with the looks of these sort of Dakar F type bikes. Um, again, interested in your comments below. It says here, Yamaha have unveiled a long distance off-road adventure focused version of the Tenere 700. The biggest change comes in the bodywork and running gear, with most focus on the new tanks. Gone is the previous single 16 litre tank in favour of dual side mounted items which boost overall capacity to 23 litres. Sounds like a good move, and that might also mean that the weight is carried a little bit lower to make it more practical off-road proposition. I'm sure this is a very practical round the world tour compared to something like, say, the big Multistrada. This is probably the bike you'd actually want to take. Fuel range of around 300 miles isn't inconceivable, very useful. Uh, weight distribution and centre of gravity will remain the same apparently. Okay, the other big chassis change comes in the suspension. New forks, new peggyback shock, both increasing suspension travel by 20 millimetres. So it puts out six, it's a 689cc parallel twin, 72.4 brake horsepower, 890 mil seat height, so a very high seat. Often these have high seats, and of course you want lots of suspension travel, so the two come kind of hand in hand, but it does sort of rule out a shorties like me a bit. Um, just too, too tall and it becomes unmanageable, which is a shame. Uh, but anyway, interesting to see again your thoughts on that. Is it just me that doesn't like the look of these Dakar style bikes? There, there are a few of these, I mean even things like the Africa Twin, which is a great bike, uh, if you forget the complicated uh, electronics. The looks of it just it doesn't quite work for me. Uh, again, completely a personal thing, I know some people love it. All right, moving on, KTM Beast meets Brabus. Now, you didn't remember earlier I was saying that KTM need to get some other designer involved. This is a joint venture they've done with Brabus, or Brabus, which do the car stuff, don't they, usually? It's like a styling house, I think. Uh, and they've taken a Super Duke R and done this to it. It's made it more almost Diavel-esque a bit, but I think it looks absolutely cracking. So it shows what can be done with a KTM if they're the right designers. Take on those Brabus designers full-time KTM. This looks epic. So it says here, limited edition time with performance car brand results in jaw-dropping 1300. Uh, we got the scoop on the KTM Brabus 1300R last month when the Austrian firm's new supercar tyre model was caught testing on the road. Uh, you don't have to look too hard to see that the Brabus 1300R is based on the existing KTM 1290 Super Duke. It retains identical performance figures as that bike. Uh, the looks and top-notch parts don't come cheap, though. Uh, if you uh, brace yourself for a 34,549 hole in your bank balance if you order one, so 35 grand for one of these. A lot of money for a KTM Super Duke, but what a beauty. But it just shows what can be done, doesn't it, if, you, if you've got the right styling house on board. I think that looks lovely, but again, sadly, out of my reach. Right, machines get an underground lair. Now this is something that just appealed to me. This is a cracking thing and something I'd thought about. I'm always moaning about having a lack of space in my garage. I love all motorcycles and if I could, I'd buy 50 of them plus. Um, pretty much every bike I ride, I think, oh, can I make space in my garage for this? And alas, I can't. So actually I'm actively trying to trying to get rid of bikes and make a bit of space in my garage. And this is one way you could do it. This is a system that allows your bikes to be stored underground. So it says here, if you're looking for secure bike storage with a touch of theatrical panache, then look no further than the Bolt, like that, like Bolt and Bike, see what they've done there? Uh, an automated sunken bike locker that would fit right into any Bond or Batman film. This really does appeal to me. Once the bolt is in place, the whole thing is encased in concrete to make it secure and to keep out moisture. Uh, so how much does all of this cost? Well, there's no easy way to say it. It's 20,900 plus VAT. So you're looking at 24 grand, something like that for one of these. Uh, and obviously it only holds one bike. So, so is this gonna solve my space problem? I think not. 24 grand buys you a lot of bike, doesn't it? Uh, so 24 grand if you want one of these clever holes in the ground in your garage. Maybe this, it's probably cheaper to extend my garage than that, but uh, I love the idea, so just thought I'd point that out there. All right, last story in this paper. 
Bigger is better. Spy shots suggest Meteor 650 and Bullet 650 are coming. Great news, I'm a big Royal Enfield fan. Looks like they're gonna uh, up the Meteor uh, somewhat. Two new Royal Enfields have been spied out during testing, suggesting the firm are expanding the range to fill the void left by their 500s going the way of the Dodo. The one that appears to be a new Meteor is the one closest to production and arguably the most exciting. It's powered by a blacked out version of Enfield's popular 650 Twin, an engine I love. Uh, the second bike, which appears more like a bullet, shares many of the new features of the Meteor, but sticks with conventional forks and spoke wheels alongside the new tank shape and straighter pipe. So a couple of these models coming out. Uh, yeah, it looks okay. I mean, it does look meteor-esque. Doesn't look anything particularly special. I'm not sure what this would give you over and above the Interceptor, to be fair. I, I love the Interceptor, of course. I'm an Interceptor owner. Um, and this, you know, I'm, I'm sure this rides beautifully. What made the Meteor so good for me was that single thumper engine in it. It was It's a 350 and it's just really smooth and really lovely for a single. In fact, I said it was the smoothest single I've ever ridden. Um, I'm not sure sticking the twin from the Interceptor is a good move. I don't know. They clearly think it is. What do you think? Would you buy one of these over an Interceptor? Do you think a, meet, a bigger Meteor is the way to go? Or do you agree with me and you think that the Interceptor actually, if you're going to go 650, that's the one to have. Interested in your views on that and see if we can gauge whether that one's going to fly off the shelves or not. All right, last paper before we get on to parish notices then. Five stories here. First one, perfect timing. Now, this is interesting. This is one of these um, special editions that Triumph come out with from time to time. They've teamed up with Breitling, the watch, posh watch manufacturer, and come up with a special edition Speed Twin. It does look nice. It's got... Um, New Olin suspension on the back, it's got a fancy paint job, it's got a um, uh, perforated leather seat, it's got um, a, a numbered yoke on it. Nice bike, so uh, yeah, very nice indeed. But the thing with it is, uh, it costs, I think it's uh, 16 grand, whereas the standard Speed Twin, when I looked up on the website, is 11 grand. So basically it's five grand for some fancy suspension and a paint job, if you're being honest about it. That just seems like way overpriced to me, as much as I like the idea of, uh, of um, you know, a special bike, which it definitely is. It's not special enough for that sort of an uplift. So I think they made a big error with the pricing. So out of interest, I thought, you know, I'll have a look at the website and it actually says that they're all sold out and they're only making, um, I, th I can't remember how many they're making actually. We'll go through the details in a minute. Uh, 270, something like that. Yeah, 270 worldwide of, of which only 36 are coming to the UK. Well, if you want one, they've all gone already, but uh, let's face it, it wouldn't be that hard to duplicate this yourself, would it? You could get a paint job um, and maybe get your seat recovered and bingo bongo, you're there. Um, anyway, so I, I don't know, there's something about these special editions that um, Triumph do. I'm not saying this is a, not a nice one. It looks nice, but... Um, they seem to knock them out with alarm and regularity. It kind of takes away the specialness when you do too many special editions. And when you charge five grand over the basic bike for not much more, I just think they're taking the Michael a little bit on this one. Am I out of order here? Let me know what you think. Anyway, what does it say? This uh, up-spec version of Trump's Speed Twin is the latest limited edition uh, to roll out of the British firm's Hinkley factory. Of course, these special editions are all made here in Britain. Is there a, maybe there's a premium to pay for that? I don't know. Uh, the bike gets a special Breitling edition paint job. There's a Breitling logo on the top of the tank with hand-painted coach line. Uh, the twin dials have a bespoke design. Yes, they've redesigned the dials, which look okay. I mean, they looked all right before, but frankly, I don't think they're even as nice as the ones that I had changed on mine. I've got some special dials on mine, which I think look better. Uh, I think they missed a trick there. Um, there's a unique perforated rib black leather seat. Big deal. Uh, special Breitling logo billet aluminium engine details. Again, big deal. The Breitling edition gets high spec, fully adjustable Olin's twin shocks with gloss black springs. Yeah, that's that's a worthwhile upgrade. Only 36 available in the UK. Each bike having an individually numbered handlebar clamp. So what? Um, and the bike will be 16 grand. So, um, I don't know. I, they've sold them all. So clearly there's at least 36 people in the country that do think it's worth it. But I, I think there's something about this that feels a little bit like they're rinsing the customer a bit. I don't know. Again, interested in your views or am I just being a bit eggy today? Right, next up, uh, warning over fake kit. Oh, this is interesting. Safety expert urges retailers to meet the standards. A leading motorcycle kit safety expert, uh, this is Paul Varnsbury, who's a viewer of this very channel. I know he'll be watching this edition of Bike News. Hi to you, Paul. Um, he says uh, he would support heavier involvement from trading standards to stamp out sellers peddling substantial products, uh, substandard products, sorry, at biking shows and events. He believes that there needs to be more done to protect customers purchasing biking gear at shows and festivals. Uh, the proposed move comes after Newham Trading Standards were welcomed along to the recent Carol Nash MCN London Motorcycle Show and they discovered 11 retailers there that were potentially selling unsafe kit. That's incredible, isn't it? And it's good that MCN are reporting this, by the way, because it was their show and they're saying there are 11 retailers there that had potentially unsafe kit. 
The latest legislation came into force in April 2018 and it deems that all riding kits sold in the United Kingdom needs to be tested and certified by law before it can be sold. Uh, by purchasing certified kit, Paul said, you're, gar you're getting a known quantity. You really cannot guarantee untested, non-certified products. So, you know, some of this kit is pretty expensive, isn't it? You've got to make sure you're seeing the proper CE certification um, uh, and what have you on here. So uh, thank you to Paul uh, for stepping in there and uh, making that point. Paul uh, always drops me a note as well when stuff like this happens. He's a, he's de he is the expert in this country as far as this is concerned. Heed what he says. If you're buying a new kit, make sure it meets all the current standards. All right, next story here, hydrogen power on the way. We've talked about hydrogen power before on Bike News, and I, for one, am very excited about this because I think this might be a more viable way uh, for future engines to be emissions-free or emissions-neutral than uh, maybe going down the electric route. It says here, Yamaha's latest work paves the way for a new breed of bikes. Yamaha have unveiled a new V8 hydrogen-powered car engine. Hydrogen engines have the potential to be carbon neutral while keeping our passion for internal combustion alive. This is why I like them. Uh, one of the major changes that must be made is the adoption of direct injection. Now, Kawasaki have already solved this petrol direct inj injection problem with their version of the H2. The H2 is well placed to make a hydrogen powered bike because forced induction is another important factor. That's what we've talked about before. Hydrogen engines have an innately friendly feel that makes them easy to use even without resorting to electronic driving aids. Now, it's not. It's not straightforward and easy you can't just run a petrol engine off of hydrogen because you have to have direct injection and these other changes but it feels like it's not far off now with at least a couple of engines the yamaha v8 and the kawasaki test engine that we saw on the h2 a couple of months back it feels like there's some good development in this area let's keep our fingers crossed in the next 20 years we actually get to see some practical hydrogen powered engines of course then the question is how do you get the hydrogen uh, and no doubt uh, the chemical processes required involve a lot of electricity so that itself might be a problem we'll see uh, let me know if you know anything about this below but I, I think there may be an issue there but uh, i've got great hope that hydrogen is perhaps going to be our savior of the internal combustion engine at least for maybe us enthusiasts this is another interesting article here, big article here about super unleaded fuel versus normal um, unleaded, so premium unleaded versus normal unleaded, also known as E5 versus E10, the E standing for the ethanol content. So E10 has 10% ethanol, E5 has 5% ethanol. So E5 is what we call super unleaded here in the UK. And they did a big test here, I won't go into all the detail, but basically they looked at what should you put in your bike. It says here, uh, we've always recommended that everyone uses super unleaded fuel in their bikes, regardless of whether it's tuned or not simply because it's of higher quality than e10 and it's better for your engine you can even see the difference when you take the engine apart so so much you could think okay that's great it's, it's better for the engine i accept that but it's more expensive well they did a test here of running two bikes with exactly exactly the same bike same tires same weight riders doing the same stuff and they found that they got more out of the e5 super unleaded uh, in terms of mar miles per pound than they did out of the e10 standard unleaded so it actually makes economic sense to run your bike on super unleaded even though it's more expensive at the pump you get more miles per gallon out of it so i'm certainly switching from now on i'm always going to be running super unleaded and you might want to do the same if you want to properly look after the engines on your bike so really interesting that i thought all right and then the final story in here before we get on to parish notices uh, ready for anything uh, uh, these are three touring bikes that they um again MCN have uh, compared here the Yamaha Tracer 9 GT versus the Kawasaki Versus 1000 S Tourer and the new Honda NT 1100. Uh, these are sort of, well, I don't know, how would you describe these? These aren't so much sport tourers, maybe adventure tourers, I don't know how we describe these niches. Uh, I've ridden um, all these bikes except for the new Honda, that is coming though again. Uh, let's see what the verdict is from MCN. Again, that Honda got rave reviews when it was initially reviewed, didn't it? They've given the Kawasaki Versus five stars the uh, Honda 4 and the Tracer 9 GT 4 stars. So they've said that the uh, the Kawasaki Versus is the way to go. John Ari says, sadly, the NT falls short in, in uh, a few critical areas. This is the Honda, uh, and that spoils the whole package. Again, no one mentioned these when those original test runs were done, when they did it in some sunny climb, did they? Uh, they were all saying how great the bike is. It's great in a straight line, but not so much fun in other situations. Bewildering switch gear, terrible screen mechanism, lumpy engine, and clunky gearbox, not to mention the drab looks. This is like it's a different bike to the one they reviewed a few weeks ago. Um, all conspired to make the NT somewhat underwhelming. Compared to the spirited and exciting Tracer and superb do-it-all versus, it struggles to stand out, so they really don't like the Honda, or at least John Murray doesn't. Um, while the Tracer is certainly more spirited and agile, ultimately you could do far more and greater comfort on the versus, which makes it our top pick, so they love the versus. Unfortunately, I think the versus is the least good looking out of that bunch personally, but again, personal taste, but they certainly love it. All right, that's it for the papers then, which means it's time for...
that's it, parish notices, where uh, I'll tell you what's coming up on the channel in the next month. So I haven't got any particular new news to give you, but I just wanted to let you know what's coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Got a packed month for you in March. Got uh, at least eight videos coming up, maybe more. Uh, and these are what I've got. So first off, I've got my uh, first ride review of the Royal Enfield Classic 350. Haven't ridden it yet. I'm getting it, I think, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I'm hoping to bring you that review by Saturday. So that's the fifth. So I'm going to get turn that run around as quick as I possibly can, because I think that's a, that's going to be a video that's eagerly awaited. So really looking forward to riding that. That's a beautiful looking bike with the same engine as the Meteor. I think it could be a winner for Royal Enfield, that one. Then another eagerly um, anticipated bike, the Triumph Tiger 660. I'm going to be doing a ride of that as well uh, later this week. I'll be putting that video up on the 9th, so that's next Wednesday. You'll see the 660. Then I've got the first in a brand new series of my classic rides. These are in association with my new channel sponsor, Superbike Factory. Uh, I'll be riding the Kawasaki ZZR 1400 uh, and bringing you my review of that. So uh, really looking forward to seeing what you make of that review uh, and also getting your uh, requests for other what I call classic bikes uh, that can be reviewed in future episodes of that. I've got uh, a few more lined up but I'll be interested again put your comments below any bikes from the last 20 years that you'd like me to review I can probably get hold of them now and ride them. Now again don't get all hung up on the word classic I'm calling it classic review because it's classic to my mind any bike that was around before I started riding which was like 10 years ago when I got my license is a classic as far as I'm concerned so these bikes may not be classic in the in the sense that they're you know really old but they're classic to me because uh, they mean something to me. Anyway, so the ZZR 1400 is coming up first uh, and then more to follow. Then on the 16th, middle of the month, I've got my next biker scram with Jeff and Dan long overdue. This was a ride out on the Multistrada up to the Super Sausage Cafe uh, where we tried to go before and it was closed. You remember that? So we finally got to go there. Uh, that's coming up middle of the month. Then I've got uh, another of a new series, which I'm calling Garage Talk. This basically is a look around at the stuff I've changed on my bikes that I personally own in my garage over the last few months. I did one a couple of months back, it got great views, and it seems that people like those sort of uh, chatting to the camera, general mooching about the garage talk video. So I'm gonna make that a bit of a regular series. So I'm calling it Garage Talk. First one of those comes up on the 19th. Uh, then I've got my in-depth review on the Multistrada V4, living with that bike coming up on the 23rd. I've got my first review of the Honda NC 750 X DCT, again, a bike that gets requested a lot, coming up on the 26th. And then the next bike news will be on the 30th of March, all being well. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, that's that's what's coming up. Hope you enjoyed that, uh, or hope you, some of those appeal to you anyway. Uh, do leave all your comments below. I must say a massive thank you to you for watching as ever, and thank you to uh, my sponsors, of course, who make all this possible, and massive, massive thanks to my members and to my patrons. It's very much appreciated for all the support you guys give me. I'm hoping this year maybe we can do some sort of a ride out together or something like that, but uh, so stay tuned for that one, uh, or you know, join up with the patron and you can see how that's going to work itself out. All right, that's it for this time. Hope you enjoyed that. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. If you haven't done so already, don't forget, hit that subscribe button, and that way I can speak to you on the next video. Until then, this has been the Mist and Fly. Cheerio. And welcome back to Bike News, this time for the month of February 2022. The, uh, let's do that again. And welcome to another episode of Bike News, the monthly series hit... <laughs> And welcome to another edition of Bike News, the uh, monthly chance, monthly chance to take a look, let's do that. Now, all that's been going on in MCN and uh, the world of bike news here, oh God, let's get this right, man.